Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. John DeYard, and welcome to the Life Spa Podcast. And today, I'd like to talk about Ayurvedic breathing technique, something that I've been studying and teaching for decades. Uh, back in the early 1990s, I started teaching pranayama techniques to my patients, and I would tell them, you know, this is the most powerful tool that I can give you, but it's the one with the least compliance. Folks just didn't stick with it. And in this podcast, what I'd like to do is go over the power of the science and the ancient wisdom of these amazing techniques. I'm going to teach you a bunch of these techniques. I'm going to give you uh, a kind of routine of how to kind of rehab your whole respiratory tract and drive the prana where it needs to go and give you all the science behind it. And I'm also going to help you understand why it's so difficult to stick with it and how you can overcome those hurdles and get the benefits of this. You know, of late, there's been amazing books written. Uh, James Nestor wrote a book called Breath, and my dear friend uh, Patrick McEwen wrote a book called The Oxygen Advantage. I wrote a book back in the early 1990s called Body, Mind, and Sport, which was based on research that I did uh, on nose breathing versus mouth breathing and exercise. So I'd like to share a little bit about sort of my journey first to start off telling you that I was, you know, a, a triathlete in the, in the 1980s, early 1980s, and um, I was a moderate triathlete, a mediocre, um, and, but I was competing with a lot of the best triathletes in the South Bay in California, and, um, and I was in chiropractic college, so I was treating a lot of them, I knew a lot of them, and I just wanted to become better. And I was reading a book called The Psychic Side of Sports, which was all about uh, the runner's high in the zone where my best race is my easiest race. And when Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile, he said, I felt like I was standing still, like I was going slow and like, wow, how do you have this amazing experience, this zone euphoric peak experience where your body is maximizing its, its performance, but internally you're feeling this peace and calm. And I call that the, the eye of the hurricane effect and the and the hurricane is calm in the middle. And the more pow more, more, the bigger the calm, right? The bigger calm we can establish, the more forceful the winds can be. So, so it became really clear to me that this whole runner's high thing that I was reading and fascinated by was really a model for life, right? How we can reach our full human potential. So I was really struck by the idea that that, um, that maybe you can increase your performance by not, you know, breaking the body down more to build it up, which was the classic, still is the classic way to build exercise strength and build, you know, performance is to really train the body. It recovers, train it again, recovers, and you build up this performance until you reach a point where you, you break down and then you fall apart and then you can't do it any longer. And uh, so I was at that point where I kept pushing, 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 and I was getting dizzy in my classes, and my friends were telling me, all well, endurance athletes, like, yeah, this is the mitochondria, they're getting used to training, but dizzy, this is part of the whole process, that your body's getting better, and all this stuff. And I was lying in the back of my classes in chiropractic, like, well, they're putting acupuncture needles in me, trying to, so I didn't get dizzy anymore. Um, so I was definitely pushing too hard, right? So then I went to this Ayurvedic uh, lecture. It was the first Ayurvedic lecture that I had been to. And I uh, heard this whole thing about Ayurveda. And afterwards, I went up to the Ayurvedic doctor and I asked him, I said, you know, I'm training for an Ironman. And uh, I'm wondering if, you know, doing these triathlons is, you know, good for you from the Ayurvedic perspective. And he said, what is that? I said, well, you know, it's a, you swim two and a half miles, you run... 26 mile marathon and then you ride 112 miles on a bike and he looked at me and he said why do you do that and i was like you know no one ever asked me that question before uh, i just did it i think because i thought i could and uh, and i looked at him and i said I, you know i started mumbling he looked at me and he said do you meditate like you're a fool right why do you do this this is crazy as you're killing yourself do you meditate at least and I looked at him and I said, well, yeah, I did. I was proud of that. I do meditate. And uh, my mom taught me how to, how to meditate. She taught, gave me the, um, you know, she helped, paid for a TM for me way back in the 1970s. And uh, so I learned that. And he looked at me and said, do you sleep while you meditate? And I was like, 
yeah, I get the deepest sleep. It's great. Like I meditate, I fall asleep, and I wake up so refreshed because I had this really deep sleep. And he looked at me again like I was a fool and said, you know, when you meditate, you're supposed to establish something called restful alertness. You're supposed to be resting, but alert at the same time, not conked out. And he said, so you're exhausted, you know, and you should probably not do that thing. And I said, this may be the smartest thing I ever thought on the, on the uh, you know, on the spur of the moment. I said, does that mean that if I can uh, meditate and not fall asleep during my meditation and train and do this stuff, it's okay for me. And he sort of looked at me and said, yeah, sort of, I guess, you know. And, uh, but that was all I needed was to say, yeah, I don't want to exhaust myself. I don't want to break myself down. I'm trying to find this place called the zone, the runner's high, where everything's easy. And, um, and I really felt that that was the model for life. Like, if you can have a runner's high zone experience, why can't you have it <clears throat> in your daytime? at work or at play or in home or at school or at wherever. Like, why does it have to be reserved for being on this field in sports? It can be in anything. And that, I really believe that I and mean, I was kind of wanted to figure out, figure that out. And that's what got me going. And um, so I started meditating a whole lot more. I started going away on meditation courses and retreats and meditating more and training less and meditating more and training less. And uh, I have many stories I can tell you, but the bottom line was all of a sudden I saw my performance starting to go up, 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 and my training sort of leveled out and went way down. I would do really short, instead of going out for a run for three hours in the, in the Hollywood Hills in California, I would, you know, go for a really efficient, you know, 20, 30 minute run. Uh, instead of going on a, you know, 50 mile bike, like riding from, I was out in Whittier, California to, to Manhattan Beach and riding my bike the whole way, you know, all day event kind of a thing, I would ride really efficiently from like Manhattan Beach to Hermosa Beach and back as fast as I could. And, uh, and all of a sudden I just saw my, my, my performance going up and up and up and up. And I went from a mediocre triathlete where I started competing, you know, pretty well, coming in top 10 and finishing, you know, placing in my age group in a handful of events. So I started doing really well. It really started to become competitive. So that really spurred me on like, wow, there's something about this kind of thing. So then I ended up, long story short, ended up getting an opportunity to go to India for a, for a short kind of vacation to try to learn Ayurvedic medicine. I was supposed to go there for a three week vacation, ended up meeting my Ayurvedic teacher. It's another long story. I ended up staying for a year and a half and learned Ayurveda. And while I was there, I, I started learning yoga and breathing and meditation techniques and particularly the breathing and the yoga and uh, started becoming more fascinated with the breath. And that's what sort of got me more interested in tying not only the meditation piece, but the, the breathing technique. And now, of course, you know, 40 years later, uh, we write all these books about the research on breathing. When I was writing my book, Body, Mind, Support, about the breathing, mouth breathing versus nose breathing, I mean, gosh, everywhere I talk, anyone I talk to, a comparative analysis, pulmonist, pulmonologist, they all said there's no difference between nose and mouth. It's crazy. You're insane. You're, you're nuts trying to think that nose breathing makes a difference. Of course, now we have tons and tons of studies to show that that's actually not true. There's a massive difference between nose and mouth breathing, and the fact is that that's a real problem. And uh, we actually published a study in the International Journal of Neuroscience back in 1992. Uh, I think it was 1992, but back way back when, uh, proving the difference between breathing through your nose and breathing through your mouth. So, and it's really simple, right? When you breathe through your mouth, if you saw a bear in the woods, you would take a <gasps> gasping breath, and that would trigger an upper chest uh, breath that would trigger receptors in the upper chest that trigger a fight or flight emergency response, right? <gasps> like that. If you saw a bear in the woods, you wouldn't go like this. That is a deeper, longer breath, activates parasympathetic receptors in the lower lobes of your lungs and it calms you down, right? So, so when you are chronically mouth breathing, <gasps> huffing and puffing while you're exercising or walking around the house doing your chores with your mouth open uh, or not realizing that you are a, a mouth breather all day long and a mouth breather and a snore at night while you sleep, you're constantly breathing into the upper chest. And what happens is the rib cage has this thing in it which is called elastic recoil. This is partly why I'm gonna tell you why now pranayam techniques are so incredibly important and why they were considered so powerful in Ayurveda thousands and thousands of years ago. 
The rib cage has elastic recoil. It squeezes down in your heart and your lungs 26,000 times per day when you breathe. So it's always trying to exhale and squeeze the air out. When you breathe in, your diaphragm, which is the lower part of your rib cage, it contracts and force it pulls the air into the into your lungs, which is like a balloon, and forces to inflate the balloon and open up that rib cage. But as soon as the diaphragm relaxes, the rib cage, the balloon goes and all the air comes flying out. That's just how it works. So we're always our rib cage is always in exhale mode, which means that the rib cage, if you don't have a really strong diaphragm to contract fully and relax fully 26,000 times per day, the rib cage, instead of being 12 levers massaging your heart and your lungs, pumping your lymphatic fluid 26,000 times per day, the rib cage starts to become a cage squeezing down in your heart and your lungs 26,000 times per day. And that becomes the problem. When we have a culture that, and it's to me say this first, studies show that elite athletes in one study, the, the most, the top elite professional athletes, they did a study with them and half of them did not have a diaphragm that was contracting and relaxing fully. So chances are, if the best athletes in the world aren't doing it right, you and I are probably not doing it right either. And part of the problem there is because we sit around too much. Now I know that you all probably do yoga and you're probably really fit and you probably do exercise and everything is going well in your life in that department, but you have to sit in a car on the way to the gym, on the way home to the gym, you sit when you eat, you sit in front of the computer when you're working, you sit in front of the couch when you're watching TV, you think about it, we sit a lot. Now if you look at traditional cultures, they didn't sit at all. Chairs are a relatively recent invention and if you go to India or Asia today, they don't sit around in chairs, they sit around and squat. So, which changes the structure of your pelvic floor and opens up your diaphragm and does completely different things that when you sit and you slouch, the diaphragm, get, the rib cage gets pushed into the upper abdomen and it pushes your diaphragm into a pre-contracted position. So now if your diaphragm is trying to contract to pull air in and open up this balloon, it can't because your rib cage got the diaphragm pushed into a pre-contracted position. So even if it contracts, it's already pre-contracted so it can't fully inflate your ribs. And there lies the problem. We start breathing more shallow because we are not fully inflating this balloon. And we start breathing more shallow. And when that happens, we start breathing into the upper <gasps> bear in the woods, chest receptors that get you up a tree, save your life, <clears throat> but they're not really very good at much else except for saving your life. They trigger a fight or flight emergency response, which is a degenerative, disease producing, lymphatic congesting, digestive compromising effect. And what's really neat about this whole discussion is, and there's just so much to this really, that everything in your whole body depends on breathing properly. I mean, breathing is the one thing when you stop doing it, it's over. I mean, that's the, you know, your heart, beat, your heart can stop, but you can get it going again. As soon as you stop breathing, it is, it's over. Um, so we really depend on, on breathing and it affects everything. So when you start to shallow breathe, right, then <clears throat> by definition, the rib cage is just going to get, in the lower part, it's going to get tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, right? So you're only breathing in the upper chest. And this is causes something which is called over-breathing. Over-breathing means you're over-breathing oxygen. In one study, they took people and 75% of the oxygen that they just breathed in, they literally breathed it right back out, unused. So we are shallow breathing, rapidly shallow breathing, in an effort to get more oxygen into our tissues, and we keep trying to jam more in, 75% of what we take in, we breathe right back out unused, so we don't even use it. So it's clearly not the way we were designed, it's completely inefficient. So what happens is, as we breathe in and try to jam in all this oxygen, we, we breathe more rapidly and we keep blowing off more CO2, and CO2 levels go down, and your oxygen levels go up. And we keep trying to jam in oxygen. So 
we end up with 98% oxygen, 99% oxygen saturation in our blood. You went to the doctor, they put an oximeter on you, that's what they're going to tell you. Oh, you're fine, you're 98% oxygen in your blood. That, my friends, is what's in your blood, not what's in your tissues. What's in your tissues is oftentimes hypoxic. In other words, we don't have the oxygen we need to drive mitochondrial energy, vitality. We have the risk of, with low oxygen in your tissues, mutagenic stem cells that can cause real problems. Um, the body, the cells need oxygen to survive, to ward off you know, bad bacteria, viruses, you know, uh, cells that are dividing in an inappropriate manner. All that depends on the amount of oxygen we have in those tissues. So when your oxygen levels go up, and your CO2 levels go down because of overbreathing. And I have an article on overbreathing on my website at lifespa.com. Just go to lifespa.com, type in overbreathing, and it'll pop up, and you can read about this whole in more detail. But when you overbreathe, you end up with high oxygen. Oxygen is a stimulating, anxiety provoking molecule. CO2 is a sedative molecule. In the 1920s and 30s, they had clinics around the country where people go in who were anxious and they would just re-breathe, they would breathe in CO2. And there were CO2 clinics. And the studies were profound. <clears throat> and still to this day, they hold water. They work great. It was just right around that time in the 40s and 50s, they started making drugs for anxiety and depression. So the whole thing of going into re-breathing and breathing in CO2 just fell out of favor but the science is still there. CO2, when you have more of it, calms you down. Oxygen, when you have too much of it, makes you more anxious. So when you overbreathe oxygen, you have too much of the anxiety provoking oxygen and not enough of the CO2. Well, also, the more oxygen you have and the less CO2 you have, the tighter the bond between your hemoglobin molecule in your blood and the oxygen, they get tighter. So all the oxygen stays in your blood, which is why, right, 75% of the oxygen you breathe in, you breathe right back out because it's unused because you can't jam any more oxygen into the hemoglobin because it's stuck there because of low CO2 levels. Because of shallow breathing, the rib cage has gotten so tight, we have to just shallow breathe and we never let the CO2 levels build up. So we become intolerant to CO2. We feel we're going to have to take another breath and we get shortness of breath way too easy because we've lost our tolerance to a little bit of a higher level of CO2. So some of the training techniques in Ayurveda is to train you to slow down your breath, even hold your breath. And what happens then? CO2 levels have time to rise. And when CO2 levels begin to rise, that's, that is the trigger to release the oxygen from the hemoglobin in your blood and drive it into your tissues. So what happens when you start slowing down your breath or get into breath holding techniques, which I'm going to talk about, you end up in doing something that hyper oxygenates your tissues. As soon as you slow down your breath, CO2 levels begin to rise or hold your breath, CO2 levels rise, all the oxygen dumps from your blood into your tissues, your oxygen in your blood starts to drop down, but the oxygen in your tissue starts to go up. And this is called Intermittent hypoxia in Western medicine. Intermittent hypoxia is when the oxygenation in your blood saturation goes down. But, as, but by definition, the oxygen saturation in your tissues goes dramatically up. And when that happens, when the body recognizes, hey, the oxygen in my blood is too low, the body does this thing. It's, it's like a cellular repair motivation. It's just kind of like the same thing when you do calorie restriction, right? You stop eating or fasting, the body goes into cellular repair, autophagy, and stem cell activation kicks in. In other words, the body goes, hey, I'm not eating any food. I don't know where I'm going to get my next meal. So you go into the cupboard, and you try to make whatever you can out of whatever is left there, and you figure out what to throw out, and you kind of do cellular repair, make food out of whatever you have left over. This is what happens in well-studied, in fact, Nobel Prize winning science on fasting, is you would trigger this whole process called autophagy, where the body you know, gets rid of old junk and, 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 and restores and rejuvenates itself under the stress of calorie restriction without starvation. When you put the body into a slower breathing pattern or you do a breath hold, the body, and this doesn't have to be uncomfortable, but the body's going to start to feel like, hey, I need air because you're so used to shallow breathing and pumping in all this oxygen all the time that you're so intolerant to even the littlest bit of CO2 levels. 
you know, so a lot of people can hold their breath for 10 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds, where the free divers hold their breath for 22 minutes, right? That's our potential. We have nowhere near our breathing potential and how critically important it is for us to get it back because when you hold your breath, CO2 levels rise, boom, oxygen dumps into your tissues. You heal, repair, rebuild, rejuvenate your tissues on a massive scale. And that is called intermittent hypoxia. That has been shown to increase stem cell activity, which is cellular repair, rejuvenation, kind of rebuilding old broken parts. It increases uh, um, something called uh, EPO, erythropoietin, which is what Lance Armstrong got busted for injecting when he lost all his uh, Tour de France medals. Um, if he only knew he could just hold his breath and make the same stuff he was injecting, he may have been better off, but, uh, but the science has proven that, that by intermittent hypoxia and doing breath holds and, and slowing down your breathing, you can, you can get, move into that state where you get these benefits. There's something called nitric oxide, which won the Nobel Prize in 1998 in chemistry as the panacea molecule for everything. And the list uh, of that goes on and on and on. And I'll talk more about nitric oxide in a minute with some of the breathing techniques that amp that up by 15 times. So we'll, we'll talk about that, but that's hugely important. It increases what's called endothelial growth factor. It heals and repairs your artery, your lining of your arteries. There's transcription factors called the guardian of your genome, which basically protects your genes from expressing negative traits that, that usually express when we get older. That's why we get sick. It's called DNA damage. And we know that, that DNA gets get damaged as we get older, and that's what causes disease and aging-related disease and things like that. All of it, which can be you know, mitigated for by making sure you're breathing properly the way we were designed, right? Also, one of my favorite things, including lower blood sugar, lower blood pressure, the list goes on and on about the benefits of intermittent hypoxia, um, but also something called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is when you change the patterns of behavior, the patterns of thinking in your brain, right? We always find ourselves mentally and emotionally doing the same dumb stuff again and again and again. And Ayurveda was about, Ayurveda, you know, in a nutshell, Means, Ayur means life, Veda means truth, so it really means the truth of your life, right? So we're trying to get to the truth of who you truly are. It's not about living a long life and being healthy, get rid of your blood pressure and your heartburn and all that. We need all that to be healthy, to bring this human instrument into balance so it can perceive more subtle energy, raise its vibration, for a, a lack of a better word, but really function and think at a higher level vibrational level. And that, in the scientific world, is called neuroplasticity. And what I found with all the breathing techniques I'm gonna share with you in just a minute, is that they all change neuroplasticity, which means they change the old protective patterns of behavior. Now in Ayurvedic medicine, there's this, this is called tarpaka kapha. Tarpaka is the memory of old stresses and traumas that we write into the white matter, etch into the white matter of our brain. So we know like if I went into that cave when I was 10 and a bear chased me out, I could be 99 and I know that cave, I'll never go back into that cave again because I have a record of that life-threatening stress. So the species has a survival you know, memory and it's called Tarpaka Kapha in Ayurveda. And it's critically important that we vet which one of those memories are important, like that cave would be stick good to keep in my brain, and ones that are stressors that aren't for my species survival, but I'm holding on to them because the body has a hard time telling the difference between which ones you can let go of and which ones you can't. This was what Ayurveda was really and truly all about, letting the Ayurveda of you, Ayur life, Veda truth, the truth of your life out. That's what these breathing techniques are about. In addition to everything I'm talking about, and I haven't even begun, I'm realizing this is like maybe a five hour lecture here, but I'm gonna try to tone this down a little bit. But, but how, how, um, you know, how um, vast the effect of breathing is on every aspect of our physiology just for physical health is mind boggling. Then when you tie in the, the, the spiritual higher vibrational, thinking at a higher level, not, not reptilian survival, but starting to think altruistically, how can I give and help and care for my community versus only protecting myself? That's the difference, right? We start functioning at a level, we start really caring about others, and their benefit actually helps us. That's the switch that Ayurveda saw, talked about, and now the science 
is backing it up, right? I just wrote an article recently about, about altruism when people give money, right? To, when, they're, when they're given um, money and they, and they give it to others versus buy it on themselves, they're across the board happy. Even the poorest people in the poorest countries in the world, when they actually gave money and bought something for someone else, their happiness factors went off the chart, even when they were giving stuff away that they desperately needed. So we, 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 are, we are connected to the whole. And the, you know, the whole is always greater than the sum of the parts. And when we think individualistically, we think of just the part. I want my part, me, to stay healthy, and that's all I care about. But as you start raising your vibration, you begin to realize kind of instinctively that we function better when we support the whole versus only supporting the parts. Really cool, really interesting kind of stuff. Anyway, so that's the, 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 whole, the whole point of the, the breathing techniques is you know, the, vast, you know, the, the vast amount of that. Now, when we did the research on, in my book, Body, Mind, and Sport, uh, way back when, we did research on nose breathing versus mouth breathing. We found that when you do nose breathing, the brain waves during vigorous exercise went into a meditative calm. When they were mouth breathing, their brain waves went into a stressed out state, like you're in a mall shopping, it's pretty stressed out, lots of input. But when you're nose breathing, same exercise, same kids, they were high school athletes, they had this incredible benefit of brainwave coherence and brainwave calm and more alpha production in the brain, which was unprecedented finding. It was published in the International Journal of Neuroscience. So all of a sudden, you're telling me that as I run, I can produce alpha meditative brain waves, which is that calm eye of the storm in the midst of this dynamic activity. How cool was that? And when your mouth is open, you're huffing and puffing, you're triggering this fight or flight beta state in your brain. In the mouth breathing, all the brain, wave, brain parts of the brain were doing something different. In mouth nose breathing, all the brain parts were doing the same thing, which means coherence function of the brain, which is really cool. We measured the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system during mouth and nose breathing. We found that during mouth breathing, the, the, the fight or flight system went up 100%, which is pretty typical in exercise. Parasympathetic, which is your calm nervous system, goes down. In nose breathing exercise, when the brain was calm, the parasympathetic uh, went up 50% and the sympathetic only went up 50%. So the two opposite nervous systems, instead of being all fight or flight, they actually balanced out. So we had the two opposite nervous systems coexisting. Dynamic activity, vigorous exercise, and internal composure and calm coexisting at the same time. This was an unprecedented finding, and this is, in my mind, the definition of the runner's high. My best race is my easiest race. We established the eye of the storm, the combination of dynamic activity and composure coexisting. Now, if you look into nature, which I'm super fascinated about because that's what Ayurveda does. That's how they figured all this stuff out. They just studied nature. They figured out that the, that, you know, the, 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 the planets are all spinning around a silent center, which is dynamic activity and a composed sense, something composed and center. The universe is structured that way. Atoms are structured with that, that way with particles spinning around a silent center. So if we can kind of kind of aspect, access that silent center, and I talk about that as one part of the Ayurveda, the Vedic uh, literature is called Dhanarved, the Veda of the bow, pulling back that bow, holding the bow perfectly still, or moving the bow around, not establishing being or silence, and then taking action, pulling back the bow and moving it around and shooting the arrow, you'll never find your arrow. But if you pull back the bow and establish silence and take action from that place, you have the coexistence of opposites. You're pulling back that bow, you're shooting this dynamic arrow from a completely silent, still place. That's the goal. That's the runner's high. And we replicated that in our studies. We not only measured that, but we measured um, that the breath rates through the nose were, were about 14 breaths per minute during vigorous exercise with 200 watts of resistance on an exercise bike. During Mouth breathing, the same kids came back the next day, did it, and their, their breaths per minute were 48 breaths per minute versus 14. We asked them, how did they feel during the two different mouth breathing versus nose breathing exercises? And we found that when they were mouth breathing, they felt a 10 out of 10 on a Borg scale of perceived exertion. That was the highest you could feel. 
They came back and did the nose breathing. The brain waves were coherent and alpha and meditative calm. Their parasympathetic levels were up uh, and their breath rate was down. Their perception was a four out of a 10. So you're running, you're competing next to somebody, you're one who's a person who's mouth breathing, their brain waves are incoherent, their fight or flight response is maximum 100%, their, uh, their blood pressure is up their fight or flight, their breath rate is, you know, 48 breaths per minute, and their perceived exertion of that stress is a 10 out of 10, the maximum they can feel, versus you now breathing through your nose, and your, your brainwave is in a meditative calm, which is restorative, parasympathetic activity, which is restorative, is increasing, your perceived exertion is a 4 versus a 10, and your breath rate is a 14 versus 48. Who's got the competitive advantage? And you're both doing the same work. That was our study. That's what launched me into the exciting area of nose breathing versus mouth breathing. And that was back in the late 80s, late 1980s and early 1990s. And I've been teaching nose breathing techniques ever since. And then piggybacking off of you know, some of my work is the work of uh, Patrick McEwen and his book, Oxygen Advantage. And James Nestor wrote a phenomenal book, really going around the world, looking at all the research that's, be doing, that's being done now on nose breathing versus mouth breathing. And it's just phenomenal. So really, really important piece of the puzzle. Um, before I forget, I should mention that nose breathing, you know, is something that you want to do during your exercise. Um, you know, and very simply put, and I've got articles at lifespot.com, just type in nose breathing exercise, and a whole bunch of articles will pop up about how to actually do it, different techniques of nose breathing during exercise. Basically, deep Long in and a, uh, a long exhale, I like to use the ujjayi breath. On the exhale, a long inhale and a... On the exhale, to create a rhythm. Top of that rhythm, a little space. Bottom of that breath, little space. So I create that rhythm of the space at the top and the bottom of each breath. And I walk for five or 10 minutes, exercising my lungs first, deep breathing, and creating that rhythm with the space at the top and the bottom of my breath. After five or 10 minutes of that, I start to go a little bit faster. As I go a little bit faster, I watch that space at the top and the bottom of the breath. As Soon as it goes a little bit faster, I immediately, instead of going faster and pushing myself into that urgency, that emergency, I slow it back down, reestablish that calm. Uh, and then once I reestablish that rhythm again, that nice, deep, long, slow nasal breathing rhythm, I like to use the ujjayi on the exhale in this regard, um, and because that creates an abdominal contraction. If you do the ujjayi and squeeze it all the way out, you'll notice that your abdominal muscles contract. They're the secondary muscles of breathing. They contract onto your diaphragm, which contracts onto your heart. So the more you use your abdominal muscles, you create abdominal diaphragmatic cardiac massage, which activates the nerve on your heart called the vagus nerve, which flips your brain into an alpha state, tells your brain, central nervous system, hey, this is not stressful. We can chill out and calm down here. And that's exactly what we showed in our study. So using the ujjayi on the exhale, is great. Usually using the ujjayi on the inhale and the exhale is better for going into dhyana or meditation to really settle it down. But here we're going into activity. We're trying to take an eye of the storm into the activity as opposed to going into meditation. Two different animals, really, um, because we're doing two different states of, of, of awareness, of functioning, right? One action, one resting. Um, so that's really, that's an important technique that I would like you to, to, to practice. And like I said, there's more information on my website about how to do that. Another starter technique that I think is really important is to start going for a walk, which you probably all do, and count how many steps you take for each breath. One, two, three steps for your inhale. One, two, three, or four steps for your exhale, right? So you keep trying to lengthen how many steps you take for your inhale and exhale. So what I'd love for you to practice is try to get to 10 steps for the inhale and 10 steps for the exhale. That's going to be our goal, right? And if we can get to that place, um, then 
you can start to extend your exhale. So now you're going to do 10 steps for your long inhalation and 10 to 20 steps for your exhalation. And what will that do for you? The longer you exhale, the more CO2 levels are going to build up. And there's a, there's a receptor in your brainstem that is a receptor for CO2, which means suffocation. And, and if we have a hair triggered CO2 receptor, we're going to always feel we need to breathe. <clears throat> and we end up, as we get older, keep needing that re trigger, that receptor, that CO2 receptor is, keeps getting more sensitive, more sensitive, more sensitive. So next thing you know, you're breathing 30, 40 breaths per minute as you get older, as opposed to losing the benefit of breathing at, I mean, you know, yogis can breathe one breath per minute versus 40 breaths per minute that someone who's stressed out is breathing, right? So, and so the longer, the more you practice slowing down your breathing during a walking level of exertion, you're doing exactly what we're trying to accomplish here is build what we call CO2 tolerance. Super simple, super effective. Now, all right, sound good? All right, so here we go. Now I wanna talk about Kumbak. Kumbak is breath holding. And uh, Kumbak is, is in Ayurvedic tech books like uh, the pra, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras or uh, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, they talk about how pranayama is not really pranayama uh, unless you do a breath hold. So breathing and breath hold, pranayama and breath holding are synonymous. Prana means, you know, uh, the breath and yama means to hold or pause. So that was the original understanding. You know, breathing of any exercise is great for you, but pranayama employs breath holding. And when you breath hold, you increase CO2 tolerance by definition. And when you increase CO2 tolerance, the world of science is saying that's something called intermittent hypoxia, which increases stem cells, EPO, nitric oxide, transcription factors, the guardian of your genome, endothelial growth factors, lower blood sugar, lower blood pressure, neuroplasticity, all the stuff we mentioned, which is pretty crazy, right? So now, somehow, they knew thousands of years ago, this is really important because, because of stress, we, we get more stressed out, we start shallow breathing, and we lose the benefit of dropping, having CO2 levels high enough to dump the, the oxygen into our tissues. In Ayurveda, they would give you breath holds called Antar Kumbak or Bahi Kumbak. Bahi Kumbak is a breath hold on the exhale. Antar uh, Kumbak is a breath hold on the inhale. So if someone was anxious and worried and stressed out, they'd want to calm them down. So how do you do that? You build up CO2. How do you build up CO2? Do a breath hold on the exhale. exhale. Breathe all the air out so CO2 is going to rise faster and give you more CO2 more quickly and therefore a calming effect. If someone was lethargic and melancholy and depressed and they needed more energy, they would actually do a breath hold on the inhale, breathe all the way in and hold the breath and that would trigger more oxygen into the tissue, into the body and then that would create uh, more of a stimulating effect. But, in, in, and that was when people probably weren't as uh, shallow breathing and over breathing as we do in our culture because they never sat around like we do today and that's why it's so important, but it's a beautiful understanding. And I've got articles on Kumbach or breath retention. Just go to lifespa.com, type in breath retention, and you'll get tons of articles. And when I mean articles, I'm talking about the science behind them so you can kind of dig into that, uh, which is really important. Then I should probably mention before I get into the breathing techniques here that the sleep thing is really critically important. You know, traditional cultures like in India and Native Americans, they absolutely all trained their children to be nose breathers. They would put them on their side, tuck their chin. You know, when I was in India studying about, when I first learned about nose breathing in India, I started going to libraries to dig into the research because I was sort of, you know, I was into the runner's high thing. I just wanted to learn about the, you know, the benefits of nose breathing versus mouth breathing for performance and high potential and human potential and all this like really lofty stuff. And all I kept finding were articles on, you know, parents teaching their kids how to nose breathe and how kids who nose breathe never got sick. And there was one study on infantries in the army where they had nose breathing, you know, infantries and mouth breathing infantries and the mouth breathing infantries always got sick and the nose breathers never got sick, stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I don't care about that. I just care about performance and, you know, you know, the magic, you know, it's always looking for that. But 
what I found was how important it was for us to all learn how to nose breathe. And as a result of not breathing properly, we now have really great science showing that mouth breathing kids have facial uh, development issues, airway development issues, which is linked to uh, all types of cognitive decline function, ADT with young kids. I did a podcast with Sharon Moore, who wrote a book called, uh, called um, uh, Sleep Wrecked Kids. Uh, James Nestor writes about that in his book a little bit uh, on breath. Uh, I've written a bunch of articles on why our mouth is too small for our wisdom teeth because we didn't learn how to breathe properly and now we're pulling teeth out instead of letting the jaw, the, the jaw get wider and bigger to support open, higher, open, uh, wider airways and better brain respiration. All this stuff happens and we sort of threw that out the window and just started pulling teeth and putting braces on them. So there's a whole bunch of science about that and how important it is. But one of the things you can all do is make sure that you're a nose breather. And I ask all my patients, do you sleep? Do you snore at night? And they go, oh, no, I don't do that. I go, do you breathe with, do you open up your mouth when they, you just, do you sleep with your mouth open? They go, oh, no, 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 I don't do that. I go, well, how do you know? And they go, well, I don't know. I, I don't. I always, you know, and so you don't know, okay? We, none of us know because we're asleep. But one way you can kind of tell is that if you wake up with your mouth ever with your mouth dry in the morning, for so many reasons, this is an important reason for you to shut your mouth and put tape on your mouth. And I use a tape uh, every night. Uh, I'm doing it for years now. Uh, it's called Micropore 3N tape, 3M tape uh, for sensitive skin. Your lips, you know, qualify sensitive skin. And it's blue. And you can start by just putting one piece like right here and just close your mouth and see how you do in the morning. You can still breathe through the side of your mouth. You can even talk through the side of your mouth if you need to talk to your spouse or whatever. Um, and just see if that tape's still there in the morning. And if it's there in the morning, um, you're great. Um, and uh, what I like to do still to this day, I like to get a really nice seal across my whole mouth. And then when I wake up and it's just still sealed like it was in, in, the, in the night, you take off the tape, your mouth literally, the hygiene of your mouth is exactly the same as when you went to bed. It's like you, you know, when you brush, you brush your teeth, you, you feel really clean in your mouth. You wake up with that same level of clean. You don't have that ama on your tongue. None of that happens. And you didn't change the environment of your mouth. You didn't give the environment, which happens when you're dry out your mouth, your mouth is open for opportunistic bacteria like uh, volatile sulfur compounds and streptococcus mutans, which proliferate in your mouth, get into your gums and cause heart disease to the tune of 63% of the heart disease is caused by that. And now they're looking at Alzheimer's, which is caused by that, right? All because you're letting the bacteria get into your blood through your mouth while you sleep at night. Not to mention snoring and sleep apnea, all on the same factor, which are linked to stroke and things like that. So how simple is that? And when you breathe through your nose, you're breathing in nitric oxide. When you breathe through your mouth, you breathe zero nitric oxide. We produce nitric oxide in the paranasal sinuses. Paranasal sinuses um, produce this gas while you breathe through your nose. So think about it. You're out talking to people all day long. There's COVID, this and that you're breathing in. Then, and that happens when you open up your mouth. You go to bed at night, close your mouth, you sleep. Now you're taking this most powerful antiviral gas into your whole respiratory tract doing an antiviral immune scrub for your whole respiratory system. Like how beautiful is that? If your mouth is open, you get zero of that. And nitric oxide is not just for an immune response. It's like the panacea molecule that won the Nobel Prize in 1998. How crazy is that? And in a minute, I'm going to show you a technique of how to boost that production of nitric oxide by 15 times. So stay tuned. And at the end of this lecture, I'm going to give you a strategy of how to, what breathing techniques to do in the morning, and what breathing techniques to do at night. So stay tuned, don't leave me yet, because we're still getting, you know, moving on. But so point being, making sure you're a nose breather at night, making sure you're a nose breather when you exercise, making sure you're starting to practice slowing down your breathing. That's what we know so far, right? I hope this all is, uh, is making sense for you, um, which is really, really important. So what I found was that all the breathing techniques that I researched, and I researched and written articles about a ton of them, they all seem to have one common denominator, which was neuroplasticity. They increased neuroplasticity. I was like, wow, that's what this is really about. Breathing at a higher level, dumping the oxygen to your tissues, cleaning out the brain lymphatics, um, 
that tarpa kapha that holds on to the emotional trauma. Taparka also means brain cleansing. It's the brain cerebral spinal lymphatic movement that dumps all the trash out through the brain lymphatic system, which has now been studied, to dump out three pounds of plaque and garbage out of your head every year while you sleep at night. And if you're not breathing correctly, you don't get that out of your head very effectively. So that's why it's so important. So breathing techniques increases brain respiration, brain detox, and therefore neuroplasticity, changing those old patterns of behavior. The things we, you know, we all find ourselves, all of us do, doing the same dumb thing again and again in our life, same kind of relationship, same kind of stress. We're going for the holidays. We're acting like a four-year-old again. And we all know the, 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 you know, the drill. And we can change that. By, by amping up your, your, your respiratory efficiency and how, how cool is that. So the first one is, is, is the one I started where I was teaching years ago under a um, breathing technique I called the one minute meditation, which uses bastrika, which is the bellows breath, um, that you can do like 30 bellows breaths or bastrika, uh, followed by 30 seconds of, of being still. And that I call the one minute meditation. Well, the bellows breath has been shown to, you know, first initially increase, you know, stimulation or, or, or sympathetic activity, but quickly followed by a massive and long-lasting surge of parasympathetic activity. It lowers blood pressure, lowers blood sugar, uh, increases your reaction time, actually supports cardiovascular function and, and ability to actually match aerobic exercise in one study. And you know, I've written about an art. Just go to my website at lifespot.com, type in Bastrika, B H A S T R I K A, Bastrika, and you'll get all the science behind it so you can see what I'm talking about. It increases also, which I thought was cool, gamma wave production. And gamma waves are a different kind of brain wave that are linked to universal love, uh, altruism, right? Which is that place where all of a sudden you're thinking about the whole, not thinking about just the parts, right? That's altruism. That's the cool place to be. All of a sudden, you're not doing it because you're, you know, going to get some reward or win the Nobel Prize. You're doing it because it's just your nature to do that. Because that's where you start functioning from that place of your true nature, which I think is just beautiful. The higher virtue, higher vibration, higher values, higher levels of thinking happen. So that bastrika is a simple breathing technique where you just, and I have a video on that, I'll just give you a quick glimpse of that right now, but that's just a bit bellows breath where it's all the way in like a bellows and all the way out like a bellows through the nose, it looks something like this. Do that about 30 times, sit still. Amazing calm you get when you go into that 30 seconds of meditation. You open your eyes, you feel completely different. Just an amazing, amazing technique. And that's called Bastrika. I call it the one minute meditation. <clears throat> you can do it, <clears throat> you can do it, you know, one time a day, twice a day, 10 times a day. You do it 10 times a day, it's 10 minutes of your day to have a massive effect in terms of how you feel. I call it instant, or at least within a minute, um, you know, rest, deep rest on demand. Uh, you know, it's, it's available for you at any time. You feel stressed out, go into your car, do the Bastrika, chill, and then do a quick rest. It's really, really beautiful. Um, another breathing technique that I love is called Kapalabhate. Kapalabhate is Kapala, starts with a K-A-P-A-L-A, -A -A. Kapala means skull, bhate means to illuminate or to cleanse, so it literally means to cleanse out the skull. Ayurveda, that's tarpaka, that's where you restore the old emotional trauma and memories, and that's how we clean out the brain lymphatic. That's what that means, hard science now. Ayurveda had all kinds of ways, all kinds of ways to clean that out, which is just, I think, phenomenal, really, because, you know, you know I've been in practice since 1984, you know, at the end of the day, it's always this crazy mind of us, that call, mind of ours that causes all the problems, right? It's, that's just how it works. And so to get that cleaned out is such a gift. And Ayurveda was, I really believe, all about that. That's why they're Vedic sciences as opposed to just medical sciences. They're Vedic because they're really about letting the truth out, you know, letting something real, raising that vibration, functioning, thinking at a more altruistic state where you're not thinking about just you. You're more you're concerned about the whole. 
And I've written a ton of articles about the crazy science, about how when you start doing that, how your body thrives. Better bacteria, better bugs, longer telomeres on your, on your, in your chromosomes and your DNA. You know, uh, completely you know, b beneficial changes in your uh, epigenetically, on your genetic code, when you give to others with not needing anything in return versus giving to others and wanting something in return. Uh, you know, the oxytocin, the longevity hormone, when you give care and love, touch others, surges. When you give and love and touch others with something in return, and you want that reward, it actually decreases your oxytocin levels, your longevity hormone. So the list just goes on and on and on. Um, so Kapalabhati is a really interesting art, uh, breathing technique because what you do with that when you breathe in, you breathe in through your nose. And you breathe out and you use your abdominal muscles to breathe the air out. So um, usually the, the rib cage is naturally squeezing the air out. But in this case, you're using your abdominal muscles to push the air out. And when you push the air out with your abdominal muscles, you push the diaphragm up into, the, up into your uh, lung cavity, into your thoracic cavity. And that creates like a real reverberation of your diaphragm. So it's like, you know, first contracting the diaphragm all the way and then pushing on it and getting it to relax and then doing it again and pushing on it and getting it to relax. And the research on this is quite phenomenal. Let me show it to you first. So it's basically like breathing in. And you can... <coughs> Excuse me, you can feel that diaphragm getting pushed up into the rib cage and forcing the air up into your skull and doing a brain lymphatic effect. And all of a sudden now you're using, you're using the, the, what's called the dead space or the residual uh, inspiratory, inspiratory volume of your lower lobes of your lungs that never get access. All of a sudden you're using them and you're forcing that air out. So new air can get all the way into that that inspiratory dead space or that residual volume that we never really use, which is really cool. So we're, we're knocking on the door of another level of respiratory efficiency, which is you know really, really cool, um, which happens to be one of the ways that we detoxify. We detoxify through our lungs, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but our breathing is one of the major ways to get rid of fats and triglycerides and environmental pollutants and toxins. We literally breathe them out because the body breaks them down into a gas and then we breathe them out with the CO2 in, in, in massive quantities. So not breathing efficiently means you're not detoxifying efficiently, which means toxins build up in your blood, your tissues, your brain, your muscles, your joints, you know, and accelerate the degenerative aging process. Um, the um, the Kapalabhati uh, is a, a phenomenal breathing technique for that tarpaka kapha of cleaning out the brain. It's been studied for lower blood sugar, lower cholesterol, lower triglycerides, uh, for blood pressure. It's really been studied for metabolic syndrome, you know, supports that as well in a really effective way. It's uh, a little bit of a heating technique, so it can increase pitta, so be careful. Be kind and gentle to your body uh, with this breathing technique and go to my website at lifespot.com, type in Kapalavate and read how exactly how to do that breathing technique as well. Then one of my favorite breathing techniques called Brahmari, which is the humming breathing technique where you breathe in with ujjayi on the inhale and then a humming breath on the exhale. The humming has been shown to increase your nitric oxide production by 15 times. So if you then would take your fingers and plug your ears, ujjayi on the inhale, on the exhale, you'll feel a resonating effect, right? Which is crazy. And now you're increasing your nitric oxide levels by 15 times. So we're gonna, we're gonna use this in a minute as we put together a plan for you to be really, really effective. It also increases gamma waves, that altruistic waveform in your brain where you care about others more than you care about yourself, by 10 minutes. So it, so it lasts and lingers for 10 minutes. So this is a really great pre-meditation breathing technique, right? Because you're getting this altruistic, higher vibration, higher virtue, breathing, universal love kind of breathing technique uh, that, that's supported by gamma wave activity that you don't get necessarily with the other breathing techniques. Prasrika, you get it. Um, this one 
you get it as well, according to the science. It also increases, the nitric oxide increases more glutathione, which is your uh, and SOD superoxide dismutase, which are enzymes in your liver to detoxify, repair, rebuild, which is really important. It's been shown to lower blood sugar, boost immunity on powerful levels, right? Because we know that the gas, the nitric oxide, is one of the most powerful antibacterial, antiviral gases. So if you're breathing in a lot of who knows what, at night you close your mouth, you breathe through your nose, you wash your whole respiratory tract with this antiviral gas. It's nature's way of making sure we don't get sick. But none of us do it but you can kind of hack that by putting some tape on your mouth. It increases the oxygenation of your tissues, which amps up mitochondrial energy, so you can drive more energy into the body, uh, lowers blood pressure, the list goes on. It was Nobel Prize winning, and they call it the panacea, and Nobel Prize winners don't use the word panacea because it's too lofty, but they did in 1998 when this won the Nobel Prize. So just to be aware of that, and it's a powerful tool for um, it's a powerful tool for, um, for uh, making sure that you um, uh, detoxify and clean out the tarpa cacafa in the brain as well because um, you're creating that vibration. Mm, you can kind of feel your whole head kind of vibrating, which is a crazy feeling, which is really wonderful. Okay, so in a minute or two, we're going to talk about how to put these together with a morning practice and an evening practice, so stay tuned. I want to talk about one more thing, and that's the benefits. We, we touched on it a little bit. You know when you breathe normally with your regular, what's called tidal volume, how you breathe in and breathe out normally on average? The average person breathes in about, uh, 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 well, how it works is about 22 pounds of toxic fat converts to about 18 pounds of carbon dioxide waste exhaled. So it's a very efficient process of the fats converting into CO2 that we literally breathe out. So, and I wrote an article on that called Burning Fat, uh, burn, uh, Boost Fat Metabolism with This Breathing Technique. So type that in lifespot.com, read about the science. It's really quite amazing and how critically important that is really. And when you actually breathe with all five lobes of your lungs and access that residual inspiratory volume, the, the tidal volume is what most of us breathe into, but there's that dead space, that inspiratory residual volume, that gives you six times more access to the oxygen. So if you start breathing with all five lobes of your lungs, which is what the whole Ayurvedic thing was about, you increase your ability to move waste out through the breathing by six times, right? and how critically important that is, right? And how, how, how very valuable that is. So the, the idea in Ayurveda was that you would always make sure that your tools for detox were maximized, optimized. And that was breathing would be step one. Digestion and elimination, step two. Healthy quality of your skin, inner skin and outer skin was step three. They all had to be in place, otherwise really nothing works well. You don't breathe well, you're in big trouble. Your digestion is compromised, you know, it doesn't happen. Your inner skin was really the, kill, the critical piece of that. So breathing for all that. Now, what I didn't mention to you so far is that the diaphragm is critically important as well for the breathing process. The diaphragm is the number one pump for your lymphatic system. The, all of the lymph in your belly is pumped out by a healthy functioning diaphragm. But if your diaphragm is not functioning well, and like I said with the elite athletes, not functioning very well, then all that waste builds up in your, diet, in your belly and you get extra belly fat, hip fat, cellulite, all that kind of stuff begins to happen. Partly because your lymph drainage systems are compromised because we're not breathing very, very well. And this goes into a little bit more of a rabbit hole because when you tie breathing to digestion, we go, oh my God, this whole thing gets crazy, but stay with me for a second and I'll tell, talk to you about that. Your stomach, your diaphragm is here, your esophagus is here, your stomach is right here. And what can happen, and your liver is right down below that. And your liver makes bile, and it says, hey, I got enough bile here to neutralize whatever amount of acid you produce up here. But if the stomach um, makes, you know, eats a ham sandwich or something like that, and you need X amount of acid to break down the protein in the ham and the, pro the gluten in the bread, uh, you're going to need somewhere amount of bile from the liver to emulsify the fat and to neutralize the acid. 
But if your liver is congested because of bad fats and processed food and toxins, which are very common in our culture, the liver can't make enough bile, so the stomach decides to hold on to the food longer than it should. And that can push up against the diaphragm. And when it pushes up against the diaphragm, it can actually, stomach can actually sometimes stick through or herniate through the diaphragm. It's called a hiatal hernia. But a lot of people don't get that bad of a problem. They just get indigestion. They get heartburn, indigestion, nausea, burping, belching, tummy aches, they can't shortness of breath, lack of breathing. And then you end up again starting to shallow breathe again to mitigate the fact that your stomach is pushed up against your diaphragm. And how in the world is your diaphragm supposed to contract fully when you got a big old stomach stuck to it? It can't, so it just can't fully contract. Then if you're sitting and slouching, pushing your rib cage into it, it's sort of your damned, you know, it's your damned if you do, because you're just not going to be able to get that diaphragm to contract. And then what happens is um, the diaphragm slowly doesn't contract. It affects breathing, sleep breathing, um, your oxygenation, your function of your diaphragm. Remember, your diaphragm is the number one lymphatic pump. Research with women with breast cancer found that the vast majority of women with, with uh, breast cancer had congestion in the anterior diaphragmatic lymph nodes, right? So it all matters. And why you don't want to sweep those digestive concerns under the rug. Um, and I have breathing techniques. One of my favorite ones is called Pratiloma. I've written about that in an article called Breathe Away Your Heartburn. Another article called Strengthen Your Lungs Now, Pratiloma. Pratiloma is the Ayurvedic breathing technique for your diaphragm. And that's so critically important that you do that. I wrote articles called, called Stomach Pulling, which are techniques for your diaphragm to kind of free up your stomach and your diaphragm so they're not stuck together. I can't tell you how important you know, this is from a mechanical perspective. I know I'm throwing a lot at you. Um, and maybe you can listen to this again and go to these articles, but you got to fix this. This is something you can't just let linger. Uh, if you have digestive weaknesses, you know, you know, go to my, uh, my digestive troubleshooting ebook, which is free, takes you step by step, free, how to troubleshoot your digestion. Um, if you have, you know, these breathing concerns, go to this article in this podcast. I've got suggested reading for all these links that you can go to for all these breathing techniques to help you get out of harm's way. The Pratiloma, my favorite breathing technique, which is one I think everybody should start with, and that's called, that's where you partially close your nostrils and you pinch your nostrils and you breathe in maximally through your nose. The partially closed nostrils creates resistance, so your diaphragm is, has to work extra hard. So it's an aggressive breathing technique, something like the Bastrika, where you breathe in, all the way in, open up your nostrils, let it out. And again, all the way into you feel under your diaphragm, your, your rib cage, you feel your diaphragm contract. Open up your nostrils, let it out. So it looked like this. Let it out. And again, let it out. And again, and let it out. So you would do that 10 to 30 times. 10 only if you're getting a little dizzy, just back off, but build up slowly to 30. Then once you get to 30, you do three to five sets of that, 30, with partially closed nostrils, 30 inhales, followed by an exhale on a breath hold on the last exhale. So if you do 30 maximal inhales, followed by 30 of those, the last exhale, hold your breath. As soon as you feel the urge to breathe again, don't strain. This is not to be uncomfortable in any way. It's not an endurance event. As soon as you feel the urge to breathe, just go right back into another Pratiloma inhale. Open up your nostrils, let that out. And these are techniques in Western medicine called inspiratory muscle training. Ayurveda uses it with your fingers. In Western medicine, they use it with a little device to make it harder to breathe in. Same basic technique. That's been approved for COVID. It's been used for blood pressure. It's also been studied for reversing heartburn and GERD, right? So there's breathing techniques literally in the medical journals that are exactly like the Ayurveda breathing technique called Pratiloma. I've got articles about reading about this. This is a phenomenal one. I do highly recommend it. Everybody does this for the first month, three to five sets a day, twice a day for a month to get your diaphragm back on board. Most of us don't have one that's working very well. 
That's critically important. And then your diaphragm is working for you, so now you have the detox ability. You tie that together with seasonal foods, right? Every time you seasons change, the foods change, the microbes on those foods change, and that all creates a seasonal flushing and a seasonal cleanse. In Ayurveda, at every change of season, the body becomes very vulnerable to disease. So detoxing during the change of seasons is critically important, which is why we have our big Colorado cleanse, which is our 14-day digestive reset, limb cleanse, intestinal skin repair, reset the upper digestion, and pull the toxic yuck out of your tissues for 14 days. We do it every spring and every fall because that's when nature is trying to shovel out the waste to prepare you to go into winter or go into summer without having a massive accumulation of toxins from the seasons prior, right? So beautiful Ayurveda does that. It knows that if you get dried out in the winter, right, you're gonna produce reactive mucus in your skin, your mucous membranes from being dried out in the winter. Then you have kapha season, which says, hey, we're all about mucus and rain and mud and moisture, so we're gonna antidote all that dryness. But to the extent you got dry in the winter, it's to the extent you're gonna make more mucus in the spring, right? And that's congestion, that's kapha, that's congestion. Now, if you don't shovel out that kapha in the spring, the summer heat comes in and bakes that mucus onto your tissues as hardened mucoid material, which makes your intestinal skin leathery, you know, like leather, not functional, which becomes very difficult to absorb and assimilate your nutrition, it alters the microbiome and the bugs in your gut, all kinds of bad things happen. Now, at the end of the summer, that heat builds up, and if you don't get rid of that heat, with the proper seasonal foods of apples and pomegranates and watermelons and all the cooling foods to get rid of the heat out of the body, then the heat uh, and the hot and dry of summer is, is, is uh, followed by the cold and dry of winter. So the cold helps us with the heat, but the dryness of summer becomes excessively dryness in dry, more dry in the winter. So we just keep amping up more dryness, more dryness, more reactive mucus, more reactive mucus, more kapha, more congestion. So we keep amping that up. So if you have, you know, hay fever in the end of summer, you probably need to go back to the end of winter to find the cause of that. We didn't follow the rules. So in Ayurveda, it's all about eating with the season. We publish a free recipe eating guide called the Three Season Diet Eating Guide where you get recipes and grocery lists and superfoods for every month of the year for free just to get you to get the right bugs and the right season and the right foods to antidote the accumulation or the aggravation of the quality of each season. Uh, you know, in the, summer, in the winter, it's cold. Nature's antidote for that cold is spring. And the, 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 the foods that are harvested in the spring antidote help not, us not get overly congested, right? Think about the spring foods. There's no pasta in the spring. It's very austere and astringent in the spring to help antidote that kapha. And then summer when it gets hot, you get the seasonal cooling foods, fruits and vegetables to cool the excess heat. In the winter when it's dry, you get nuts and seeds to antidote the dryness of winter. Nature had a plan for that, but every seasonal change, there's an opportunity for the body to accumulate and become more toxic. And that's what Ayurveda says clearly that the disease takes place and initiates itself at the change of seasons. So consider every change of season doing something. We have a short home cleanse, which is a free ebook at lifespa.com, which is just four days, a quick seasonal detox to get shoveled out some, some accumulated impurities, accumulated heat in the summer, accumulated mucus in the spring, accumulated dryness and cold in the winter. Every seasonal change you can do that. And twice a year in the spring and the fall during the big detox seasons, we have the Colorado cleanse, which is a 14-day digestive reset, lymphatic cleanse, intestinal skin repair, change your microbiome to the right bugs for the right season, uh, pull the impurities out of your deep tissues that have been stored, and studies show that's, been, that's done to, uh, to pull heavy metals out of your deep tissues, pesticides and uh, PCBs and other toxic environmental pollutants out of your, out of your tissues by 40 to 50%. I've uh, been shown to detox heavy metals for six weeks in, study, in one study and three months in another study. After you do the cleanse, it continues to initiate a powerful detox. So in our toxic world, and I got to tell you, there's a lot of people saying, oh, your liver is fine. It detoxifies the environment. You don't need to detoxify. I, get, I, I read the studies every day that, come, that are published, and I have uh, at least, there are at least two studies a day now 
talking about the damage of air pollution and how toxic it is for babies, for instance, for cognitive function, for Alzheimer's, for, uh, it's mind boggling. We live in a toxic environment. Ayurveda talked about detoxifying thousands of years ago when the environment was clean. They understood the value of that. So please don't miss the, the window of opportunity uh, in the spring and the fall, at the very least, to do some detox. And we always put our cleanses on sale. We get massive discounts every spring and fall. So check those out, okay? Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, your morning breathing routine and your evening breathing routine. I love starting the morning with sun salutation. Um, if you can't do that, I've got articles and videos online how to do that. I love that because it's a breathing slash moving technique. It just gets everything moving so you can move that prana with your breath into those deep tissues because if you wake up stiff, you don't really penetrate the, that subtle energy prana life force as well or as efficiently. So the first breathing technique that I would say well, after you do your sun salutations is do the pratiloma. Um, and if you've already done your month of pratiloma to get your diaphragm back on, online, you have an option of doing pratiloma, bastrika, or kapalabhate as your first breathing technique. This is gonna be like a breathing technique to help get you to a morning meditation. So wake up a little earlier. And even if it's just five minutes, it's fine. I mean, this technique, this technique can last anywhere between 20 to 40, med 40 minutes, depending on how much time you have. I mean, breathing techniques, once you get in the rhythm, you just wanna do them all day long because they're so rejuvenating. But you know, if you do a quick five minute pratiloma, five minute sun salutation rather, then the pratiloma uh, or the bastrika or the kapalabhate, one of those for five minutes. And then you follow that by slow alternate nostril breathing or slow nadi shodhana, which is the same thing. And that's when you breathe in one side, out the other, in the same side, out the other. So in, out, in, now, in, now. It's called alternate nostril breathing or Nadi Shodhana. And you can do that with your fingers. You can breathe in and then out. In through the left. And then out. In through the right. And then out. So super simple, in, out, in, out, very simple. Now what you can do is you can make it slow. You can do a four to eight count on the inhale, a four to eight count on the inhale hold, a four to eight count on the exhale, and a four to eight count on the exhale hold. So you can add a breath hold to really slow it down. And what does that do? Increase the CO2, and what does that do? starts to activate a, you know, a sedative effect. So you go into a more still effect, right? More calming effect, prepping you for meditation. So that would be like inhale, four, hold, one, two, three, four. Close the left, open the right, out, one, two, three, four. Hold on the exhale, one, two, three, four. Close the right, uh, I'm sorry, in the right, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, exhale, other side, left, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, in the same side, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four, block that side, open up the other side, out, one, two, three, four, hold, one, two, three, four. You can extend that to eight to 10 seconds and continue to become more efficient at slowing and lengthening your breath. After you do five minutes of alternate nostril, slow alternate nostril breathing with breath holes top and bottom, you can then do, um, you can do the Brahmari breathing technique. Now this is really cool. Now you're just gonna do, just sit there, you're in your meditation position, you're breathing in. Ujjayi, and you can do the hum. Now you're amping up nitric oxide. You're putting your body into gamma wave, gamma wave activity. You're really upping your vibration into gamma, altruistic brain waves, higher brain wave functioning. And then after that, after five minutes of that, even just five or 10 minutes, whatever you can do, five or 10 minutes of each of these is 20 to 40 minutes worth. And that's your morning routine and then go right into your meditation. And that could be another five or 10 minutes or longer, depending on how much time you have. 
but that's the routine. So you start out with uh, the sun salutation, five minutes pratiloma, five minutes uh, the, uh, the pratiloma vasrika or, or uh, kapalabhate, five minutes, and then you go into the brahmari, which is the humming breath for five minutes, and then you go into your meditation. You can do five or 10 minutes of those, depending on your leg. Really awesome morning routine. I mean, you do that morning routine every day, you're fine. I did say earlier that I would love for you all to do a month worth of the pratyaloma, three to five steps per day. So let's start with that first because that's critical to get your diaphragm kicked into gear. And then the EM, the PM technique, which I love to do before you go to bed. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of meditation before you go to bed. A lot of the time you spend going to sleep in the early parts of sleep or shoveling out all the thinking and the stress and the, and the, and the, the previewing of the day's activity that we, and that we had that day. Studies show that we, we do when we go to sleep and we just review everything that happened that day. And if it's stressful, we just keep shoveling it out, shoveling it out, and it has a hard time for the body to go into the deeper stages of sleep. So meditation before you go to bed can actually just shovel all that out for you. So you're not having to go to sleep and having to toss and turn, shoveling that out. You meditate and it's getting rid of stress at will for you. And if you prime that with some slow breathing techniques, and my favorite one for that is slow Nadi Shodhana, which we just talked to you about, then slow uh, Ujjayi, same exact breathing technique, Ujjayi breathing, using that kind of ocean breath on the inhale. One, two, three, four on the in. Hold. One, two, three, four. Exhale. One, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four, inhale, four count, hold, four count, exhale, four count, hold. You can lengthen that to four to eight to 10 count. Really lengthen your breath. And now you went from, you went from this slow Nadi Shodhana to the slow Ujjayi to the slow Brahmari. Brahmari activates gamma wave activity, nitric oxide wave activation by 15 times. And then you slip into your meditation where you can take advantage of that gamma wave, gamma wave activity, which is that altruistic thinking of the whole more than you think about the parts. So that evening technique can start with some yoga if you have time, but ideally just you can just get into bed, sit up, do your slow Nadi Shodhana, slow alternate nostril breathing, same technique, slow uh, Ujjayi uh, also for five to 10 minutes, and then the Brahmari, five to 10 minutes, and then your meditation, and go off and do your meditation before you go to bed. And uh, that's pretty much it. That's your, your morning and your evening routine. And like I said, there are articles on each of these breathing techniques that go into the details and the science and videos to show you how to do them in a whole set, you know, how to do the whole routine. So uh, a little bit of homework for you, hopefully motivating for you to do these breathing techniques and take advantage of the breathing. And, you know, like I said, this is the most powerful thing that I teach over all these decades. Uh, people don't do it. Why? Because the rib cage has become tight. Well, the key to, to getting that, once you get that open and you go over that hump, which is why I give you the 10 to 30 pratilomas twice a day for a month, religiously hit that for a month. Just like I said, 10 to 30 pratilomas on the inhale, followed by a gentle, comfortable breath hold. Do that three to five times a day for a month. In that month, you're gonna open up that rib cage, you'll be free, and then you just maintain it with the morning and before you go to bed, breathing, meditation, practice, and you're golden. Um, and make huge strides in terms of your longevity, your optimal health, and maybe most importantly, you know, this, this Ayurvedic of you, you know, understanding the, the, the truth of you raising your vibration becoming more altruistic you know and realizing that we thrive as a human being we think of others more than we think of ourselves that's hard science so it's a beautiful place to go and the breathing is one of the most powerful techniques to get us there thanks for listening i'll see you next time i'm dr john Biard. do you like this video don't forget to subscribe and share this recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.